What is up, you beautiful people? Welcome back to the Build on Bitcoin podcast, where we cover all the innovation happening across the Bitcoin ecosystem. So that is what I do here. I talk directly to the founders and builders, expanding the utility of Bitcoin. No price talk under that here. Today, I have a very special podcast guest. Lanib Ali is on the show, and we talk about a ton of topics. So if you don't know Munib, which is kind of crazy, especially if you like this podcast, because uh, he's been building interesting stuff in the Bitcoin space for quite some time. Initially, he worked on something called One Name, which is bringing identity directly to Bitcoin, and then jumped into building something called Blockstack with the team. Uh, him and Ryan Shade co-created that. That spun off into what we now know as Stacks, and he is now currently the CEO of Trust Machines, which is trying to build the largest directory, the largest basket of Bitcoin-focused applications. So we cover a ton in this topic. Uh, I was really curious about some of the questions of his background that you don't really see in other podcasts. And then on the Bitcoin side, I had to ask him about ordinals. There's such a big shift going on right now in the Bitcoin space. People are, are seeing interest here. And they're coming in in droves to like expand and build new use cases. It's driving some people crazy. I think most people love it. I want to get his take. It's also curious what he thinks is the most interesting thing happening in Bitcoin. Is it ordinals? Or maybe is it something else like rollups, lightning, DLCs, or something else I wasn't aware of? He had a pretty interesting answer for that one. So we cover a ton in this uh, conversation that went, felt like it went way too fast in this half hour. but. Let's just jump right in to this excellent conversation with Munib Ali, the co-creator of Stacks. Welcome to Built on Bitcoin. Munib, how are you doing, my man? Good. Uh, great to be here. Glad, glad to have you. Uh, very excited for this conversation. And uh, I'd be remiss to say, first of all, thank you, one, for doing this podcast. This, this is a great honor. But two, before I found Stacks, um, it's, it's safe to say Stacks changed my life, I'll say that much. Because before I found Stacks in May of 2021, I was working at a grocery store. I always loved tech, never got into tech. And since then, I work you know, at Stacks Ventures or Bitcoin Frontier Fund. Spent all my time talking about Bitcoin and Stacks. Uh, so it's crazy how much life has changed in the past two years. So just a small, a small thank you for you and all the team for what you guys have been building. This is amazing. Uh, always, always great to hear stories like these. Love it. Love it. Well, uh, I think to kick it off, I think we'll probably dance around. I'm not sure where this is going to go. Uh, we'll keep it fluid. But Bitcoin attracts a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. And so I always love to hear what initially fascinated you about Bitcoin. Yes. So I think I would say when I discovered Bitcoin, it was definitely the distributed systems of peer-to-peer -peer network side of things that attracted me first. Like I was, I'm, I'm an engineer at heart. Like that's the angle I was taking it. And I do think that it actually took me a while, maybe even a couple of years um, before I really got interested in the economic side of Bitcoin. Like before I really kind of like that deeper into hard money and the type of like, you know, problems around uh, historically when, for example, the U.S. moved away from the gold standard or, or before that, like the type of um, problems with money printing and inflation, like that was not on top of my mind, at least when I discovered Bitcoin. When, when I discovered it around summer 20, 2013, it was purely as a, look, I've, I've seen many peer-to-peer -peer systems before, uh, like, like almost like a decade ago, literally a decade ago, I would say. Um, I worked on these distributed hash table based peer to peer protocols that were storing data. There's this project called Cord out of MIT that I was pretty fascinated with. And I sort of like wrote my own implementation of that back in the day, um, uh, proposed some sort of improvements to it so that it can run in very small, low powered networks. Uh, These used to be called like sensor networks back in the day. Now they're called Internet of Things, like everyday small devices that have internet connectivity, but they're very low power. Uh, so in a way, I was trying to modify existing peer-to-peer -peer protocols to run on these 
sort of like extreme, uh, you know, networks as a student and just for fun and, and for research and whatnot. So I was definitely attracted by the peer-to-peer -peer networking aspect of Bitcoin, like how they're maintaining the global ledger and how the, the act of maintaining the global ledger actually solves and simplifies a lot of the problems that I've experienced sort of like firsthand in peer-to-peer -peer networks, right? Like in a, in a peer network, you never have a good idea of the global state. You, you actually don't know what is the state of the network because it's sort of like impossible to actually uh, actually know that in a, in, a, in a truly kind of like peer-to-peer -peer decentralized network. But over here, you do have a decentralized network, but you have a fairly clear picture of what the global state is, right? Because they're just sort of like maintaining this global ledger. And that was a pretty, pretty interesting thing. So the first thing is, you know, just fascinated by what it is. And the second thought was very quickly, what else can be built with it, right? Because I wasn't attracted by the money aspect, at least initially, I think I've become a much bigger believer in that uh, later on, uh, that yes, the money use case is actually the primary one, right? Like that's, that's act, it's actually bringing a lot of uh, kind of like value to the world. But my, my initial thoughts were, hey, what else can be built? Uh, using using this technology, which is which is sort of like the reason why every other crypto project exists, right? Like they're using global ledgers like blockchains to build other type, types of things on top. So I wouldn't say it was sort of like unique to me, but it was a very natural uh, thing thing that happened. Got it. And what was what was the appeal? Because the, the tech is interesting, but like. It wasn't until I found Stacks that I'm like, okay, user-owned internet, I guess that'd be good. Like there's some benefits to it. But most people, you find peer-to-peer -peer through like Napster first or Kazaa, whatever your LimeWire, whatever your flavor of the week is. And it, it's, 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 it's use cases you could, de it was illegal, obviously, but like it couldn't be stopped. It's, it's, it's this network. And I've heard you talk about in the Coinbase or on the Block podcast about censorship in Pakistan. It, was that kind of the through line that led you to finding these so interesting? Yeah, I would say two things, right? So uh, growing up in Pakistan in the late 90s, um, I, I, was, I was sort of like very fortunate to get my hands on a computer and a, an internet connection like really early. I think 97 is when I came online, which uh, might be early even from like developed country, country standards as well. And at that time, like there was um, like you'll use like IRC channels. And I, I remember even like trying to host my own IRC servers and, and channels. Uh, and it was it was a little bit like I've seen the centralization of the internet, right? So it's one it's one thing that, you know, I experienced, you know, state controlled media and other, other types of uh, kind of like negative effects of centralization in my country. And when I discovered the internet, it was sort of like, I think, it opened the door to a free flow of information. Like I would actually get to read about other kind of like information and data about uh, what was taught to us in history books. And and pretty quickly realized that, you know, our history books are sort of like, there's a lot of pro propaganda in there, right? Like, and, and, and even school books, right? Like there's a lot of pro propaganda in there. And it's as a kid, like, I think it's sort of like, changes you when you suddenly realize that what people are trying to teach you in school might not actually be true. And, and you're getting your information from, uh, from the internet. And I think that's a, it's, it's a very similar feeling to when people are slowly realizing that the established mainstream media might not actually be reporting the facts, right? And sometimes you actually get the facts uh, that are crowdsourced and you're, you're getting, you're piecing them together on Twitter or, or other sources, you know, like people feel both frustration towards the established media that, hey, I trusted you. And it turned out that you were actually misrepresenting what's happening. And then it also makes you value the community-based decentralized knowledge base a lot more, that at least there's a way for you to go out and seek the truth and connect with people. And so I think I sort of like had that experience like very early on, which made me more appreciative of decentralized technologies, right? And then then uh, between late 90s and I would say uh, mid mid 2000s, I kind of like clearly saw the shift from the more decentralized early internet to a much more centralized internet, right? Like where everyone's, everyone's going through the peer-to-peer -peer networks, like they sort of like died off, right? Like or IRC was replaced by other more centrally controlled 
uh, like chat services, like, you know, ICQ or MS Messenger. I'm dating myself, but I have used all those products in the past. And I think um, it makes you realize that, hey, I can't run my own instance of MS Messenger or whatever, right? Like uh, I am now dependent on all the product changes that this company is making. Uh, and at that time, people weren't even that worried about um, data retention and privacy implication. It was more about, okay, now this product is completely in control with, with the single company. And and now in this day and age, the first thought is always like, hey, this company can actually read every single uh, you know type thing that I'm typing and they know so much about me. And like creepy things happen, right? Like it's a, uh, so I, I do think some of the earlier experiences uh, kind of like nudged me towards the path of appreciating decentralization probably a lot earlier uh, than, than many other people. Got it. Super interesting. Yeah, hi history is definitely written by the victors, as they say. Um, it's interesting. There's I, I talked to Larry Salibra on the podcast recently. I also talked to Alexei from Interlay. And they both got into Bitcoin around 2013, which is a special vintage, it seems like, in Bitcoin's lifetime. Um, and I think that's when you guys started one name as well. So I'd love to just like, just as like a data point, what, what was it like building back then? But then maybe briefly, like why, as you start tinkering from distributed systems into, I'm going to build on Bitcoin with this one name thing, this ID thing, uh, what went into that decision and how you, how you thought about it? Yeah. So I think the, the reason why the 2013 um, year maybe attracted more, more people uh, is because like I, I look at the the bull markets and Bitcoin and the broader crypto industry as sort of like the times when more people enter and more capital enters the industry, right? So it's like you just go to a next level and go to a next level from there. So I think the bull market before 2013, a Bitcoin was like so small that very few people actually were were able to pay attention and and come in. I think it was just very very small. So 2013 bull market, I would classify that as the first one where at least the early adopters in places like Silicon Valley did get to hear about Bitcoin and, and they sort of like came in, right? Uh, and I was like part, part of that group, right? So I, I've, I've sort of like seen the Bitcoin paper before. I always wanted to learn more about it. I think the, the earliest interaction I had with Bitcoin was around 2011, but there was a seminar at Princeton about, about Bitcoin. And I think I even saved the, the white paper. Never read it, but saved it. To read, it's, it's kind of like funny if I would have, would have discovered it really two years earlier, what would have happened. But uh, um, I, I do think, like in some ways, like I don't want to take credit for discovering it in 2013. 2013 was a year when a bunch of early adopters in Silicon Valley did discover Bitcoin, but some of them maybe just wrote it off, moved on. I think the thing that was different was like we just sort of like stuck around, and then we saw like more people come in 2017, even more people come in 2021. And it's sort of like in these cycles, I, I feel that people, at least like obviously people are discovering it all the time, but in terms of a massive wave of like new, new fresh blood coming in, uh, that that's why I think 2013 mat mattered in terms of like what we we're doing. So it was me and Ryan Che, really, really, really smart guy. You should get him on the, on the podcast sometime. And we were really at that time thinking about this like infrastructure for decentralized internet. I think we even had a name for this. It was called... Um, I'm, I'm blanking now. It's called Freenet or something like that. It, it, it was the idea was a blockchain based internet. Like, what would that look like? And we were thinking about like which blockchain should it be? And sort of like really believers in Bitcoin. It was sort of like the only uh, uh, major network at that time. And interestingly, um, it was the, the idea was like, where do you want to start, right? So uh, if you look at the internet analogy. Uh, internet, one of the core components of internet is the DNS system, right? Like you, one of the first things you do is you register a website and it can resolve. Uh, and I think that's kind of like uh, how people come online. So the idea was, hey, if you want to sort of like build this, this sort of a decentralized internet that is based on, on blockchains, what's the first critical component that you should build? And building the DNS-like system, which you know ended up being BNS, the Bitcoin name, name system was the first thing. And one name was really an, a client application. It was it was meant as a showcase, uh, as hey, here's here's what this can look like, right? So it's like it's almost like a about me page. And the exciting thing about it was it's it's powered by this blockchain based decentralized internet. Even if it's very limited, we didn't have like that much storage. Uh, uh, we didn't have sort of like the other parts of the stack figured out. 
but at least the, the, the names aspect was there. And I, I, interestingly, like, you know, when we were making those design decisions about should we, should we build on Bitcoin? Should we start a different blockchain? Should we build on something that exists like Namecoin? I think they, they ended up being like pretty fundamental decisions. Uh, like, like imagine if you decided to start a different blockchain back then, like this is pre Ethereum. And because we were looking for, uh, for, for the kind of functionality that ended up being on, on stacks, the other idea was like, Hey, let's build on Bitcoin, which led us to Bitcoin L2s. So I think like you wouldn't, you wouldn't like appreciate those big decisions now, but it's a huge difference between ending up building a Bitcoin L2 versus building kind of like a separate blockchain. And, and I don't think we thought that hard about these design decisions like back then, uh, and but sort of like fall on our gut feelings and where what, if, what, what felt like right to do at that time. And I do think that Bitcoin L2s are very underappreciated even, even right now. Uh, like I think as the L2s actually mature and you can unlock Bitcoin capital, you can unlock all the functionality uh, that's happening elsewhere very easily, very seamlessly around Bitcoin. I do think there's going to be that big question then that, hey, if you could just do it on the largest, most secure asset class, why should you know people people go elsewhere? Uh, and if, I know it sounds still crazy like today, but uh, if Bitcoin wins, I, I, it's hard for me to imagine that all of these applications will not come to Bitcoin. Like in some shape or form, I do think they're going to eventually eventually come to Bitcoin. Well said. That, that's actually a good segue to a question I was curious about where uh, Matt O'Dell will say, like, stay humble in stack sets. And uh, the founder of Stacker News says, good morning, make something Bitcoiners want. And Stacker News is a very Bitcoin maxi. It's like a hacker news for, for it's maxi-ish. I post there, like, I get roasted whenever I post a, post a video. They'll say I'm a stack shill. Besides the point, um, but that question of, Good morning, make something Bitcoiners want. It's actually weird for me to answer when I think about stacks, for example, because what Bitcoiners want is very diverse depending on what group you're in. Um, and so I'm curious about how do you how do you think about building when you're contrarian Bitcoiner, if you will? Like the culture has been very uh, aggressive to stacks for a while. It's shifting now for, for the better. But I'm curious, how, how do you think about building for Bitcoiners and like staying on focus when the market is resistant. Yeah, so I think it's 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 very interesting, right? Like if you um, if you look at the type of technologies that are sort of like kosher in in those circles, uh, they just basically have one one thing in common, and that is that there are no other tokens involved, right? Like they they'll, they'll accept any technology, be it like a peer to peer system, a federated system. A, anything else, but as long as there's sort of like no tokens involved, they're they're fine with it. But actually, actually, there has been some pushback to ordinals as well, and you know, this because of NFTs that there might be some speculation happening with NFTs as well. So maybe maybe that's where the immune system kicks in. But interestingly, this idea that Bitcoin is going to scale in theirs is a pretty well accepted thing, even in the maxi circles. Right. So the interesting thing is that there are basically three options. Option one is that you have a peer-to-peer -peer L2 that does not have a global ledger. That's Lightning, right? So what's the trade-off? So you don't have a token. They like it. You effectively don't have smart contracts because you don't have a full execution environment, and they are trying to live with it, right? And But it's it's a scalability solution. It's kind of like an L2, and you can use it for simple things like payment. So that's, that's Lightning. The other design choice is that, okay, you do want to have a ledger and because you want to have more advanced applications and an execution environment, and that's liquid. But they will turn it into a federation because they don't want to have a token, right? So that's that's like the second, they're not even, the example would be liquid, but it's an entire category. You can design all sorts of systems where you can say it's a federation, uh, so we don't want to have a token, but you have to trust the federation and you can have sort of like, you know, more, more, more functionality. And the third thing is that it's not a federation, it's open. Uh, it has full execution environment because it has a global ledger to store the data, to execute things and so on. So it's, it's sort of like has more features than Lightning. Uh, but the, the quote unquote trade-off here is that it has a token because, you know, you, the, the only other way would be either you 
kill the functionality and make it a very simple P2P layer. Or if you want the global ledger, you have to make it a federation and then trust certain entities to run it. I think those are the three three things. And, and the, the point that I feel that, that a lot of these circles are missing is that the rest of the crypto industry, it's not the case that they can't build federations or they can't build like lightning like, like networks. They absolutely, absolutely can, right? There's a reason that they're not building those things and they're, they're building the open networks, right? Because these things are just for a developer in this day and age, if you can go and build on open networks, why would you ever build on a federation? Or if you can go and work with really powerful full execution environments, why would you ever go and, right, and work with something that's much more constrained? Right? So one thing to realize is that it's, it's not that there's anything uh, unique about building in Bitcoin where, uh, where, where, where developers, for example, uh, the developers were building outside of Bitcoin, they absolutely have the option to build lightning-like solutions. They absolutely have the option to build federations. And they're just not doing that. That's this free market signal out there because most of the developers are outside of Bitcoin right now. Because that's a very, very clear signal that building open networks that do have full execution environments is a clear preference that developers have. So if you're not meeting that demand, if you're sort of like, you know, free market is giving us the data. And if you're not meeting that demand on the developer side in the Bitcoin circles, developers are just going to ignore you. And which is the thing that has sort of like happened, right? Like most of the development is happening elsewhere uh, and not in the Bitcoin circles. And so if you really want to change that, you'll have to give developers their tools, uh, which are powerful enough and that they actually want to use. And I think over there, you would have to just admit the uh, what would look like a downside uh, to the Maxi community, that there is another token which is needed because you don't want a federation. Got it. It's just just design trade-offs. You got to pick your poison. Um, okay, so when it comes to developers, that that's an interesting one. And ordinals seems to be shifting things where before ordinals, which is crazy to think it's only been like three months maybe, but before <laughs> February, Bitcoin felt like super inaccessible to build on, especially at the L1 level. It was like, you're a core developer, and then you're kind of like in the ecosystem of that, and it's a super high level elite technical hackers doing that stuff. The regular guys going to Solidity, or maybe if they're forward thinking, they'll build on Clarity or something like that. Uh, what's your pulse since you've been building here for so long on the the shift that's happening to Bitcoin builder culture since Ordinals have kind of moved the Overton window, if you will? Yeah, I think I think Ordinals were very very special, right? Like uh, the way I see this is. Uh, it, it has some pretty interesting properties that were unique. One, the changes needed for Ordinal to happen, they sort of like already happened with Taproot. And Taproot had all the support uh, because it, it came from the right parties and had the right sort of like political support in the Bitcoin circles. And Taproot was already live, right? And Ordinals was discovered much later. If you reverse the timing, if Ordinals was something that was like planned and there, it was already a plan, to have these types of NFTs online and they required a taproot-like system to go live, I think it was very easy to sort of like push it off that, hey, we don't want this. There would be like, you know, the usual like uproar around changing Bitcoin and this is dangerous and so on. And it it would not, it maybe it wouldn't go live. So it was a very interesting sort of like timing that uh, it came much later than taproot and ended up just using taproot, right? So it, So that's one. The, the second thing is similarly, it's something that's live on Bitcoin L1 today and the consensus rules accept it. And you compare that to the block size wars where there were people who wanted to kind of like you know, experiment more or have more data on chain and enable like these types of applications. And they just basically had to fork away and they died off, right? Like because a lot of talented people, they could see that, you know, the main fork of Bitcoin will be this one and they sort of like stuck around the main, the main chain. Uh, but but the, some of those use cases could have been interesting. Like maybe an ordinals like thing could have even started on Bitcoin L1 if if you know more data was 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 if you figured it out in a, in, a, in a sensible way. I was against the the block size increase at that time, uh, right? But I do think I was supportive of the use cases. I was supportive of like, hey, let's figure out other ways of of having these use cases. Uh, without increasing the, the the block size, and in in some ways, ordinals is that right? Taproot is that it is allowing you to put more data 
uh, in a more sort of like you know efficient manner on on, on chain and, and so on. But the bigger picture thing here is this is not a case where Ordinals community gets forked away from Bitcoin and goes off to a small island to die. They're part of Bitcoin a lot. And I think the third interesting thing was that there was a lot of people were already kind of like sick of this closed off mentality where, you know, every new idea gets shut down and every, every developer gets yelled at, but they didn't really have like a common flag to stand under, right? Because if, let's say if, if someone like Jeremy Rubin is proposing an idea, uh, is getting yelled at, like people would be supportive, but not enough people care about it that, you know, everyone's going to sort of like get under the flag of Jeremy Rubin's proposal. Whereas NFTs are generic and they're fun and they're like an easy thing to get behind, right? Like a lot of people can just support them even in a fun way uh, as well. So I do think that using um, this particular use case as a flag for the non-maxi community to kind of like, you know, gather and show strength in numbers and, and support each other was actually pretty important, right? And then it has a very direct um uh, market impact because there are so many users, so many kind of like uh, creatives who want to come and use these things, so many brands actually want to come and use these things. That then the typical thing of like, there's an actual market for which builders are building and, you know, uh, users are coming and using the products uh, that that cycle started, which was very, very important uh, because I think that, that, that had to happen uh, for things to actually become real, right? Like if you're a company, if you're a wallet company, Xverse or Hero, and you're shipping these features, you're not building in a vacuum anymore. You have real users who are demanding this, those features out of you because, because it's a very real use case. And I think that's that's what makes Ordinals like really special. Like something that you just, it lives on L1, you can't sort of like stop it because the protocol is already live. You can't fork it away. And I think the appeal is very, very broad. So it's a, it's a very, it, it helps uh, sort of like counterbalance the, the sort of like the maxi circles by giving people like a common thing to come and support and sort of like build a, build a community around it. Excellent. Okay, I want to be respectful of your time. So I got one one last question. I'm going to leave it pretty broad. So out of anything you've read recently or anything you're working on, what are you, what are you most excited about right now in, in anything you're working on in red, whether it's Bitcoin or, or, or anything else? I'm, I'm I'm very excited about some of the rollups work on on Bitcoin because I think uh, especially when I looked a little bit deeper and and realized that very minimal changes are needed at Bitcoin L1. You just need like you know one op code like op snark verify or op snark verify uh, at Bitcoin L1, and then most of the rest of the things can happen in rollups. And it, interestingly, you know Bitcoin does change. Like we did get seg segwit, we did get taproot. So even if it takes years and you can get that one opcode, that might be the only thing that Bitcoin needs to implement. And maybe Bitcoin could ossify after that because at, at that point, Bitcoin L2s would, from a security perspective, would be exactly the same as Ethereum L2s, right? Because now you can bring the capital, like BTC capital or other capital uh, back to L1 by using the L1 security. Right? And this is the main difference that people point out right now when they say, hey, Stacks L2 doesn't have that property because Ethereum L2s have that property. And like but when that opcode change happens, like then there's no difference, right? So it would actually solidify uh, the case for building on Bitcoin because if most of the applications and traction is actually happening in ETH L2s and there's already market data, these ETH L2s are valuable, users are coming there, developers are coming there, so the same thing can happen happen on Bitcoin. So I think I think rollups are super interesting. I think they and uh, that's how the future of scalability likely uh, on L2s would happen. And and to actually have a clear path to hey these things can easily happen on Bitcoin uh, is very exciting, right? And it actually helps the the stacks layer as well because then things like SBDC they become the theoretical best thing you can do until the L1 changes can be made, right? So if you have to wait like four years, five years for those changes to be made, there's at least a clear commercial path to uh, having something workable that is live and people can use. And once the L1 can change, you can actually uh, sort of like adapt to, to those changes at that time as well. So it's not like we have to wait on the L1. We can do very interesting things, but give people a clear path to what, what the future uh, might look like. And in that future, 
like you can go head on with, with any L2 on, it, on, on an Ethereum. And I think that's a very good thing for Bitcoin that it's, it's able to able to compete. That sounds amazing. Uh, well, man, this has been fantastic. Any, any closing thoughts before, before we shut it down? No, I think, I think I just want to give a shout out to all of the builders, like, uh, who were there before Ordinals were, were, were there before there was like, you know, more awareness for Bitcoin L2s and so on, because, you know, they were mostly sort of like believed in, in Bitcoin and, and believed in building in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Now there is a lot more data. And I, I think still it's early days, but I think there is a lot more data. Uh, there are no, uh, a lot of traction points that you can look at and sort of like see what might happen in the future. But I think kudos to folks who were there uh, even even before that. Cool. Kudos, kudos to the builders. Well, uh, yeah, thank you. I won't do the common ask of all your social medias. People know you if listen to this podcast. Also, it'll be in the description. So, uh, but yeah, Manib, thank you for coming on and, and dropping knowledge on us. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks a lot so much for hosting. Take care. Thank you for listening this far into the episode. If you found it enjoyable, please do like, subscribe on whatever platform that you're listening on. YouTube does me a huge favor to like and subscribe. Find me on Twitter at Jake Blockchain. Show me some love. I reply to every DM. And if you are a Bitcoin builder that is kind of at the forefront of building new use cases, whether it's L1, Lightning, Stacks, Rootstock, Rollups, Ordinals, BRC20, uh, I want to talk to you. So when I'm not doing this podcast, I am the sourcing partner at the Bitcoin Frontier Fund, where we invest in Bitcoin startups at the earliest stages, give you access to whatever you need, whether it's legal, product, fundraising help, as well as capital. So love to talk to you. You can hit me up again. Find me on Twitter at Jake Blockchain and uh, shoot me a DM. I'll, I'll read everything. Love to talk to you guys. All right. Peace. Welcome to Built on Bitcoin. I know that things don't always go your way, but I'll be right here waiting. I've been waiting out, I've been trying to figure out a way to make it out. Make it out, cause I don't think about everything going wrong.